All right. Well, it is good to be back. I uh, absolutely miss being here every time I'm gone. Uh, I was gone a little longer than expected this time. Uh, <clears throat> I was only planning on being gone on last Wednesday and then came back nice and sick and uh, ended up not being able to be here on Sunday. Appreciate uh, Brother Josh and Brother Philip uh, taking the Sunday school and services. Uh, really, really, really appreciate that. Uh, trust that you've been praying for the services and the work here. Um, I will say, we're going to go ahead and get started. Tonight is going to be a little different. Um, I'm, I'm even going to go so far as to say, I'm not going to call this a sermon. We're going to call this a lesson. How about that, okay? Um, there have been some things that are on my mind uh, yet to be determined whether or not this is a one-time lesson and we just get it off my chest and we're done, uh, or whether or not this turns into a little bit of a series. Um, I'm going to have to do a little bit of explaining um, as we get into this, okay? So, the title, uh, CC asked what the title was, and I told her, and it might be a little ornery on my part. I guess some confession is good for the soul here. The title of the lesson is Happy Belated Reformation Day. Happy Belated Reformation Day. <clears throat> I have been surprised um, with the advent of or the invention of social media and everything else, um, there is a very public-facing side of, of what we say and do oftentimes. And honestly, I have been surprised uh, at the number of uh, fairly conservative, independent Baptists that have celebrated Reformation Day um, publicly, and I don't necessarily, and, and I'm, I'm going to get into some things, and I think from a historical perspective, there's absolutely some things to celebrate. There's been some side effects of the Reformation that have been really good for us. And so I'm not downplaying that, and that's why I'm saying this, this lesson takes a little bit of explanation as to why I'm even talking about it, okay? Uh, but as I've seen a growing number of, of independent Baptists that have uh, gotten into and talked about publicly, you know, uh, celebrating the Reformers and celebrating the things that they do or have done and, and things along those lines, um, it, it really brings a question to my mind. Do we know where the Baptists stand from a Reformation perspective. We're Baptists. And listen, there are some, what we call, often referred to as Baptist distinctives. There are some things that set us apart. Uh, and although anymore, not all Baptists believe this, I think as you go further back in time, it was more common than it is today. We are not Protestants. We did not come out of the Reformation, right? It's not that the, what, what we would define as um, the Lord's Church, uh, the Baptist heritage of churches, we would not say that, well, those didn't exist um, until, the Re until after the Reformation. We would not say that we um, came out of the Catholic Church, Right? Most, most Protestants, really Protestants, are going to claim that during the Reformation, uh, they were uh, all part of the Catholic Church, the Universal Church, and that in the course of all of that, uh, because the Catholic Church had become uh, contaminated, had, had, had become uh, corrupt in a lot of ways, right? Uh, or had gotten too far off of doctrinal statements, that they began to split off of, or 
it really started as a way of trying to reform the church. And honestly, when that didn't work, it became a split from the church. Uh, and I'm using that term, understand, I don't believe the Catholic Church is the church of the Lord, but uh, understand when I'm using that term what I mean. Um, we do not believe that we were one of those splits off of the Catholic Church. We would say, although we've not always been called Baptists, our lineage, our heritage, we have always been here from the time of the apostles, right? Well, I'd say actually from the time of Jesus Christ. He started his church while he was here, right? And so that is a very important distinctive that we need to make mention of. Now, unfortunately anymore, not everybody says that. Even some Baptists don't say that anymore. Now, as I find that a lot of them, they're starting, some of them are starting to not say that, you also have to understand that many of those churches are getting further and further and further away from other Baptist distinctives, right? Uh, and sometimes the Baptist name is simply just a, well, we've always been Baptist or we like the Baptist moniker and we want to keep that. Uh, and then, of course, you've got others that are simply abandoning the Baptist name. And in a lot of cases, I'm glad they're abandoning the Baptist name because they aren't really Baptists anymore. Um, uh, there, there was a post on Facebook the other day uh, of, a, of a, a Baptist church, and I'm using that term loosely, a Baptist church in uh, Richmond, Virginia, who is having a concert, and that concert is a drag queen who sings, you know, gospel music, uh, and they're raising money for uh, that community, right? Well, I thought, surely this is not real. And so I went to their actual website, not Facebook, because half the stuff on Facebook is false anyways. I went to their website. I am going to admit that I listened to an entire sermon uh, on their website. And let me tell you, they have long left the Baptist distinctives, whether their name is Baptist or not. And it's not just because of that one event. Listen, that church, if it was ever a Baptist church, is not a Baptist church. Not in the, not in the, the, the heritage and the name and the concepts that go with that. Uh, woman pastor, woman assistant pastor. Um, most of the prayers, it, it was a very... The, the, I'm not going to use the term that would normally be used because it's not one we would use. Uh, the formality was more like a Catholic church or a Lutheran church. The, 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 the preacher wore a black robe. Uh, the, you know, the choir wore fancy robes. The, there was recited sayings and, and group prayers that were memorized. Uh, the sermon itself was maybe 12 minutes. Um, and, and it was a quoting of John chapter 10 and then a quoting of some, uh, some author who uh, is all about radical love and then a recapping of what their own opinion of what John chapter 10 was, which, listen, their recap, or I think the way they even said it was, it was their, um, they were rewording John 10 in their own words, right? Listen. There was no semblance of John chapter 10 in their rewording of that. And what am I saying? Listen, just because it has the name Baptist on it does not mean it's Baptist anymore. Um, or maybe it never was. But when you look at the Baptist history, there are a lot of distinctive things. And I'm not going to get into too many of those tonight okay but that's a little bit of like point one why are we talking about this things are changing people are changing the lines are getting blurred and confused and we need to come back to what is it that sets us apart and we got to remember we're not a split out of the reformation we believe that churches like ours have been here from the time of Christ 
and that we came through the Reformation, not out of the Reformation. Now, the other reason why I'm thinking about this a lot, as I've seen this stuff on Facebook, um, listen, I was raised going to an ACE school. I love ACE in the curriculum. Like, it is my history. But listen, I do remember going through some of those ACE curriculums, and they talk about the Martin Luther and the John Calvin and, and all of these other reformers. <clears throat> and listen, when you go through ACE, you understand that these guys are put up on a pedestal. And they are great and wonderful, and, and you know, you'd think we were just like them. Now, understand ACE, I get it. A lot of ACE is not necessarily a Baptist curriculum, right? Um, but listen, for some of you that have been through those, it also is weighs on my mind. We got a lot of kids in this school, and some of them have been through some of that type of material. Even I think some of the curriculum that we use today, we don't use as much AC as we used to. Um, <coughs> uh, hist um, mystery of histories, right? Even when you read that, right? Listen, it's hard to tell what the writer of that necessarily believes themselves, but the, the reformers are lifted up high on a pedestal. And so I look at the kids in our congregation, and I don't want there to be any confusion. We are not followers of Martin Luther. We are not followers of John Calvin. Listen, some of the things those guys uh, believed some of those things those guys taught, you know what? Some of them, some of them may not be bad. Some of them sound really good until you actually understand what those words mean to them. And they don't sound so good anymore when you understand that. And so when I look at the group, the adults and the kids in here, you are going to hear a whole lot about some of those guys. You're going to hear a whole lot about the Reformation sometimes. We are not from the Reformation. We are not followers of those guys. Now, I will say this. Am I getting up here and saying that everything that those guys did is bad? I'm, I'm actually not. Listen, from a historical perspective... Those guys, one, amazingly brave. I will give them that, right? To, in their day and age, to stand up against the Catholic Church the way that they did was to take your life in hand and maybe you live tomorrow and maybe you don't. I am not taking away anything from the bravery of those guys. Um, I am not going to take away anything from the historical perspective of what they, I'm going to say, accomplished, right? So, um, to some degree, what they did weakened the stronghold that the Catholic Church had on some governments. And uh, when you look at that, some of that eventually led to some freedoms that we enjoy. And I don't think that's a, you know, some of that gets a little subjective. Would that have happened anyway? It, my personal opinion, and that's all I'm going to say it is, right, is my personal opinion is that, yeah, absolutely, that changed what Martin Luther did in Germany, changed the face of religion and state in Germany and honestly most of Europe. It, it, it spread far and wide in a lot of ways to some degree. People would say totally changed what would have been called, uh, you know, I hesitate to say it this way, but you think about the medieval times, right? Well, listen, things started to change about this time and it not only changed what was happening, you know, in an individual church here and there, but listen, stuff started changing from a governmental perspective and from a social perspective and from a religious perspective all across Europe. And listen, to some degree, there were some benefits for those of us 
and I say us meaning churches like ours uh, that were already around and are honestly suffering great persecution almost everywhere. And listen, at this point, I'm not giving his, I'm not giving like, this is where I get my information from. This is me giving to you my opinions about the impacts of some of those things. Right? I'm not going deep enough today that I need to quote from such and such a book that shows that what Luther did changed the face of, uh, of, of religion in Europe. I, I don't think I have to go show you the book and title and chapter and, ver and chapter and page for some of that. I think that that's established enough history that nobody's going to really argue with me about that. So I want to say that, right? Whenever I come down this path and I, I frown a little bit when Baptists talk about Happy Reformation Day and, and talk about how great Martin Luther was and some of this stuff, right? Um, it causes me pause, not because I don't think that the historical impact was significant, but because, listen, as Baptists, and I'm going to be pretty blunt here, as Baptist, Martin Luther would not have liked you. So these Baptists that get up here and start talking about how great Martin Luther was and how he did so much for us and blah, 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 blah. Martin Luther did not like you. You say, well, no, you don't know. Listen, read Martin Luther's own writings. If you believed in adult only baptism adult only baptism right which means what which means you don't believe in infant baptism right no baptizing of babies let me go so far as to say this if you believe in believers only baptism Martin Luther had some pretty nasty things to say about you a lot of the reformers who did a lot of good stuff historically, socially, governmental-wise, whatever, right? Did you know that some of them actually persecuted people like us? They may have split off of the Catholic Church, but that does not mean they suddenly became accepting of people like us. So much so that in some cases, they actually continued the persecution that the Catholic Church had on people like us. So I wanted to make sure that as adults and as kids in this, in this church, that when you see all that stuff, listen, take it with a grain of salt. Did they accomplish some great things? Yes. Do they believe the same things that we do? No. And there will be Baptists that try to tell you that Martin Luther was obviously a saved man and that he had this great picture of what grace was and what God's mercy was. And that although, yes, he still had some of the, the formalities of Catholics, even though he'd split off, that, that in reality, man, that guy got grace. Listen, if you have read the writings of Martin Luther, you would understand, he did not get grace. Now, I want to be careful. I want to be careful because I'm not going to be here to be the guy that judges whether or not somebody that's made a profession of faith is saved or not. But I will tell you, based on his own teachings, Martin Luther did not understand the grace and mercy of God. And that's a pretty, I get it, that's a pretty bold statement for me. But the day that you start thinking that Martin Luther believed salvation the same way we do, you're going to have to start accepting what's called baptismal regeneration, which means that baptism is what saves you. Now, some people are going to tell me, no, you're wrong, that's not what he believes. Listen. I have historically looked at some of what he said. In the last few weeks, I have looked at a whole lot of what he said at different times in his life. 
Most of these writings come after he split from the Roman Catholic Church. He did not believe baptism like we do. He did not believe in salvation like we do. Now, I think you guys know me well enough to know that I wouldn't come to you with statements like that without sharing with you from his own words what he believes, right? I tried to do that here a while back when we did some lessons on what's the difference between, you know, us and Catholicism. What's the difference between us and Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Uh, we talked a little bit about that. And I, I do not want to ever make claims about, well, this denomination or this person believes X without actually showing you for yourself what they said, right? Because, listen, there's a lot of people that say, well, I know what Baptists believe. Baptists believe that only Baptists go to heaven. Listen, I understand sometimes where, depending on which sermon you listen to, you might walk away thinking that. We don't believe that. And so I want to make sure that I'm not doing the same to somebody else. So, and listen, I'm only going to hit a snapshot of some of the things that he said. Um, there are, Martin Luther uh, actually wrote quite a bit. And, and remember, he was like, uh, his split, or the, the, when he uh, put his thesis on the church door, so to speak, right, I think it was like 80 years after the printing press had been invented. And so guess what? It had been around long enough. It was really starting to take off. Matter of fact, when you read some of what others have said and even some indications in a couple of the letters that Martin Luther himself wrote, he was surprised at how far the things that he wrote and said spread through the use of things like the printing press. Um, so he happens to come along at a time where the printing press is really taking off and, and stuff's getting written and, and, and spread uh, across a lot of places, right? So it, we actually have, uh, from a historical perspective, we have his own words. This is not what generations have passed down saying we think this is what he believed. We have his own some of his own sermons, we have some of his own letters that he wrote, we have the, the thesis that he, the, the 95 thesis or whatever that he put on the church door. We, we've got all of that stuff. Um, and so this is, this one particular is um, one of his writings on baptism specifically, okay? And listen, you read what he believes about baptism, it's going to show you a whole lot about what he believes about a lot of other things too. Um, so, let me read you a little bit from this. We'll start off from a good perspective. Uh, he starts off in his uh, treatise on, the, on baptism, he starts off with, what's the meaning of the word? Uh, baptism is, is called in the Greek language, baptismos, which means to plunge something entirely into the water. That's impressive, by the way, coming from a guy that is historically in, been in the Catholic Church, right? He goes on to say, so that water closes over it. And although in many places it is the custom no longer to thrust and plunge children into the fount of baptism, but only to pour the baptismal water upon them out of the fount, nevertheless the former is what should be done. And it would be right, according to the meaning of the word, that the child should be sunk entirely into the water and then drawn out again. So, he obviously believes in immersion, which is what we believe. We believe that you don't, aren't sprinkled, you aren't poured. We believe in immersion, right? That you're going to be fully dunked under the water and brought back up. Honestly, without that, the picture that's supposed to be there, isn't there. So, not only that, but look, when you look at the New Testament, what happened? Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water. The word itself, as he points out, means to fully immerse. Uh, I think as you do the study, you're going to find that it's kind of the same word that, that can be used for uh, the modern what we call a submarine, right? I mean, like, there's some, there's some tie back to that. It's the idea of 
fully covered under something. But you'll also notice as he was describing this, how is he describing somebody being fully under the water? Take the child and fully submerse them under the water. It's his default view. We're not saying, like, listen, I look at some of the groups, there's been some people that maybe have been saved at a young age, and maybe we've even baptized them, and you might would say, well, we baptized a child. Understand, that is not what he's talking about here. Matter of fact, even for us to describe that, if we were writing on baptism, we would talk about how you need to immerse the believer. We would not start with immerse the child, in one pace, he says, immerse the child or whoever you're baptizing. It's like an afterthought that it could not be a child. Right? Pretty big, significant difference already, right? Again, just understand the idea that his whole perspective, his whole default, well, most of the time when you baptize, you're going to be baptizing a child. We do not believe as Baptists in infant baptism. Because, as I've already mentioned, we believe in believer's baptism. An infant, I'm going to go so far as to say, has not believed, <laughs> even if you're going to say it was possible, we would have no way of knowing if they had believed or not, right? So, uh, as you get into this, there's some obvious differences, even as he just starts to simply talk about what is the word itself. Now, he does say in the next page, baptism is an external sign or token. I, hey, I actually don't know that I disagree with that statement, right? We would say that, that baptism is a, uh, a symbol, baptism is a, uh, an outward token of the fact that we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we've been, you know, buried to our sins and risen again and, and, and all of those things, right? But to us, baptism, it is a command. We are to do it. We are commanded to, if you've been saved, you need to be baptized, right? That is the expectation the Lord has for you. But other than being a command... It is a token. It does not accomplish salvation. It does not wash away your sins. Right? That's, hey, listen, guys. If you don't know that that's what Baptists believe, well, obviously, uh, I need to start preaching on some other stuff. Because that's a pretty basic one for us. He does say that. So he does say it's an external sign or token. He goes on to say, though, which so divides us from all men not baptized, that thereby we are known as a people of Christ. That doesn't sound too bad. Uh, he's our captain under whose banner we continually fight against sin. Okay. Therefore, in this holy sacrament, we must have regard to three things, the sign, the significance, and the faith. Hey, he's even using the word faith, right? The sign consists in this, that we must, that we are thrust into the water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We are not left there, for we are drawn out against. Hence, uh, the, the sign must therefore have both in its parts the putting in and the drawing out. Hey, that's not bad. Matter of fact, let me just skip ahead to his very last paragraph in this document. Uh, let's see. And this thing is long. Uh, his very last statement in this says, Let us therefore walk with carefulness and fear, that with a firm faith we hold fast the riches of God's grace and joyfully give thanks to His mercy forever and ever. And that actually sounds pretty good too, right? Man, with carefulness and fear, we may hold firm to the faith and the riches of God's grace. And joyfully give thanks to his mercy, holding, holding firm in the faith, 
God's grace, God's mercy, man, those are, that's a really good statement. But listen, whenever you read things, I, I've tried to stress before, be careful when you take something without the context it is given in. This statement starts with the word, therefore. To understand what he's saying, you have to know why he said, therefore. What were his statements before this? So let's go back and read the section right before those statements. Some of it even sounds okay. At the same time, we must have care that no false security creeps in and says to itself, baptism is so gracious and so great a thing that God will not count our sins against us. And as soon as we turn again from sin, everything is right by virtue of baptism. Meanwhile, therefore, I will live and do my own will, and afterwards, or when about to die, will remember my baptism and remind God of his covenant, and then fulfill the work and purpose of my baptism. So he's saying, listen, be careful. Don't, don't have this false sense of security that because I've been baptized, that um, I don't have to worry about sin, I don't have to worry about living for God, I don't have to worry about doing anything. Uh, until the moment I'm ready to die, and then suddenly I can repent one final time, and everything's going to be great. He says, don't do that. Okay. There are a few warnings. There, there's a few warning bells even in that statement. But I understand the principle of saying, hey, uh, don't live your life as a Christian without, like, there's no consequences and that you can just repent at the end and, like, everything's great. I understand the concept. There's some warning signs in that, too, but let's, let's, take it, let's just take it for there right now. His next paragraph says, Baptism is, indeed, so great a thing that if you turn again from sins and appeal to the covenant of baptisms, your sins are forgiven. Only see to it if thus wickedly and wantonly sin, presuming on God's grace, that the judgment does not lay hold upon you in anticipating your turning back. And beware, lest even if you then desired to believe or to trust in your baptism, uh, your trial be by God's decree so great that your faith is not which was tempted, um, that your faith is not which was tempted and mocked by God's grace. What's he saying? When he said, hey, don't, don't take the baptism so far that you think you can just live the way you want to, uh, be baptized, live the way you want to, and then when you come down to the end of life, you're going to repent and remember your baptism and call God to remember the covenant, and then things are going to be okay. But he goes on to say, well, why don't you do that? Well, well, don't do that because it could be that when you come down to the end of your life, you don't have time to repent. You don't have time to ask God to remember the baptism covenant. Or you're in so much pain, you can't do it. Well, that's the wrong motive for his statements. Because did you notice what he said about baptism at the beginning of that statement? Baptism is indeed so great a thing that if you turn again from sins and appeal to the covenant of baptism, your sins are forgiven. What? Listen, if you had read the rest of this letter or this, this writing, you would understand that um, Luther believed that in baptism... When you came out of the waters of baptism, you had been born again. Your sins up to that point had been washed away. And that baptism is so powerful that as you go throughout your life and you're fighting and you're striving to conquer sin and to put sin to death, that you will occasionally stumble, fall, have sin in your life. But if you simply remember back to your baptism and remind God of the covenant that you now share in baptism that your sins will be washed away again. Or the sins that you've had since then. Is that anything like what we believe about salvation? It's not. First off, 
We don't believe that you are born again when you come up out of the baptismal waters. That's a big difference. We do not believe that if you sin, it is the power of baptism that now forgives the sins you've had since your baptism. Because see, what Luther believed was that baptism was a covenant of grace between us and God. And that all we had to do was to take that promise of covenant back to God and remember our salvation and our sins would be again forgiven. He actually, and, and we don't necessarily have time to go into all this, he actually basically taught that the work of your salvation begins at baptism not completed until you die and are then risen again. Again, is that what we believe? Listen, it's not. It's not even close. I don't know. I, I may have to do a few more lessons on some of this because listen this is just the tip of the iceberg in regards to the differences between us I'm not trying to be mean to anybody I'm not trying to berate anybody but I want the distinction to be clear there is a difference and listen if Luther preached the way he wrote about salvation people were not getting the gospel message. The people that sat under his teaching and under his preaching were not getting the gospel message. They may have heard some of the same words. They may have heard about God's grace. They may have heard about God's mercy. They may have even heard the word faith. But in the end, and he actually basically says it at one point, I'll have to find it in this long list of things I was going to show, when it comes to faith, he basically is saying you need to have faith in your baptism. So when he says that it takes faith, he's not talking about you believe and your faith, repentance and faith and trust. He's saying get baptized and when you're being baptized, have a firm faith and belief that as the command of God was given to be baptized, that this is what my faith is in. That is so fundamentally different. <clears throat> Man, there's just like it's hard to even show you all of the differences in some of this. Um, at one point he says, So long now as you keep your pledge to God, he in turn gives you his grace and pledges himself to not count against you the sins which remain in your nature after baptism and not to regard them or condemn you because of them. That's pretty, that's pretty plain what he's saying there, right? He went on and he talked about how that, he, he, he will say that like baptism doesn't wash away all of your sins. Baptism does not blot out all your sins. But don't be mistaken, he's not saying, hey, it's just a picture, it's just a token, it doesn't blot out all your sins. What, he's, what he will say is that it blots out your sins up to that point. And then from that point, it's all about faith and believing and coming back to the baptism to help keep. So he says those things, and then he says, but you might ask, how does baptism help me if it does not altogether blot out and put away sin? His answer is, this is the place for the right understanding of the sacrament of baptism 
The Holy Sacrament of Baptism helps you because in it, God allies himself with you and becomes one with you in a gracious covenant. That, again, sounds a lot different than what we preach, doesn't it? He says, first of all, you give yourself to the sacrament of baptism and what it signifies. You desire to die and together with your sins be made new at the last day. As the sacrament declares and has been said, this God accepts at your hands and grants you baptism. And from that hour begins to make you a new man, pours into you his grace and Holy Spirit, which begins to slay nature and sin and to prepare you for the death and resurrection at the last day. Are those Baptist teachings? Those are not Baptist teachings. They are very far from Baptist teachings. And listen, this is at the core of what we believe. We're not just talking about baptism. You can even tell that from the way he says it. He's not just talking about the token of being dunked under the water and brought back up. This is core to his beliefs about what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. Which means what? Which means he's preaching a different gospel. Pretty sure there was a guy by the name of Paul that said if anybody, even an angel, comes and preaches to you or teaches to you any other gospel, let him be accursed. By the way, Luther will actually use some of those same quotes to say why the Anabaptists are heretics. And he will go so far as to say that he's not worried about the atheists, he's not worried about the, the so-and-sos. He's worried about the people like the Anabaptists that from within are destroying Christian doctrines. Those are the types of things a guy like Luther would say about some of the people that we say our lineage is through. I don't have time to get into it tonight because there's still a few other things I think I want to mention here. But listen, he specifically wrote about people like us that believe in <coughs> believer's baptism. He was fundamentally against believer's baptism. Not just against it, but couldn't stand the concept. Felt like it undermined the grace of God. Luther was not our friend. He would not have liked us. Listen to this statement. <clears throat> He's been talking about baptism and what it does and all these things. And he says this. From this it follows that when a man comes forth out of baptism, he is pure and without sin, wholly guiltless. But there are many that do not rightly understand this and think that sin is no more present. So they become slothful and negligent by um, rightly, it needs to be rightly understood and it should be known that our flesh so long as we live uh, here is by nature wicked and sinful. Part of that statement sounds okay. The problem is the beginning of that statement doesn't sound, yes hey listen after I'm saved do I still have two natures? Do I still have a nature of sin? Yes. Do I still need to strive to try to serve the Lord? Yes, 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 yes. Does any of that have anything to do with my eternal security no. Does any of that have anything to do with baptism? No. It doesn't. Listen. It's not baptism that washes away my sins. Baptism is a representation of what Christ has done for me. That is not what Luther believes. He even says, um, 
Man is drawn out of baptism and spiritually born. And through the spiritual birth is a child of grace and a justified man. Therefore, sins are drowned in baptism. In the place of sin, righteousness comes forth. One interesting thing to me about almost his entire, and this is pages of stuff, by the way. I'm just grabbing snippets. What I don't see in his dialogue about baptism, other than maybe in a passing thought, is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Like, it's not even central to the theme. I mean, I guess you could argue it is in the fact that he talks about that when you're put under and you come back up, it's the idea of being, you know, put to death and, and rising again. But listen, there's not a whole lot of reference to the shed blood of Jesus Christ and, uh, you know, how that it's the work of Jesus Christ that washes away our sins. It's almost that baptism becomes the mechanism by which Jesus Christ washes away our sins fundamentally different. Words matter. Words matter. Context of those words matter. I'm almost going to have to probably just wrap up because we're out of time. Um, I hope you understand again. I know I've thrown a lot at you. But I hope I've given you enough of his own words that even some of the younger ones in the room will understand. And they've heard, they've heard me and Brother Philip preach about baptism before. We've preached about salvation a whole bunch. I mean, I, I hope that even in the, in the snippets that I've given you, it's abundantly plain he preached a different gospel. It is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not um, repentance and faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Even his definition of faith is about faith in the baptism. Even his definition of grace is that baptism, it just, it just blows my mind, that by the act of baptism, that's what allows God to align himself with us. Ally is the word he used. That by baptism, God can now ally himself with you. And now you've got an ally to help you through your sin and the continued washing and cleansing. Listen, God is is God is the answer Jesus Christ and his death on the cross is the answer to my washing away of sin is the answer to my sin problem it's not that now God can ally himself with me I couldn't do any of it It is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, interestingly enough, and I want you to know this distinction, Luther will tell you, and you can read in his writings, that salvation is not of works. That may be what he states. He will even say it's not of works, it's of faith. But faith in what? Faith in what? In the end, faith in the fact that you submitted to baptism and what baptism did for you. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Now, and, and I've preached about baptism before, and so I, I probably should re-preach that as part of this. Um, but I've preached it not too long ago. I do want to read you one passage, and we will close with this. Ephesians chapter 2. And you, the quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, 
When in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You know what you need? You need to see that you are a condemned sinner before God. And you need to repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in faith that He that he died for you and that his death his shed blood is the only thing that can forgive you of your sins it's the only thing that can wash your sins away it's through the work of Jesus Christ that you have grace it's through the work of Jesus Christ that you have mercy it's through the work of Jesus Christ that your sins are washed away Luther would try to twist that to say yes to all of those things, but he accomplishes it through baptism. But it's not. It's not. And he had to fight continually to get people to say, what was he kept saying a couple times in my dissertation, right? Hey, just because baptism does this, don't get lazy. Because you're still sinning and you still got to get it fixed. Man. <laughs> uh, what a horrible condition to live in, by the way. What if, I, what if I sin and then before I have time to repent, 30 minutes later I die in a car crash? Well, you get a little bit further into some of his beliefs, you might figure out you might still be okay. Listen, when the Lord Jesus Christ saved me, he saved me. My sins are covered. Does that mean that I can just go sin and do everything I want to? Well, if it does, you are ignoring a whole lot of other scriptures. We dealt with that when we went through Romans. Listen, salvation is of grace alone, by faith alone. And baptism is a representation, a token of what he's done for us. All right? I went 